Okay, welcome everybody to our last slideshow lecture of the semester. And this talk on validities is going to uh, have two purposes. One is going to sum up uh, and uh, bring together many different elements of the course. And number two, it's going to help you on your paper, especially in your uh, conclusion section, because one part of the conclusions are the research methods conclusions or the methodology conclusions. And uh, you know, being able to understand and work with the ideas of internal, external, ecological validity uh, will be able to help you, uh, you know, uh, look at uh, you know, the methodological issues of the studies that you reviewed for your paper. And uh, what we're going to be talking about is validity, what makes an experiment valid. And uh, validity is good. Uh, and so uh, what we want to do, what the whole point of this course is, is designing experiments which are valid. And uh, as I said before, we're going to be, you know, bring together, I'm not going to introduce very much new material, but what I'm going to be do, uh, doing is bring together all the material, especially on validity, uh, from McBride. So what makes an experiment va valid? These things, construct, internal, external, ecological, and statistical conclusion validity. So first, let's review some basic definitions. Construct validity is how well you operationalize the hypothetical constructs in your experiment. Internal validity, uh, it could mean a couple different things, but it basically means the experiment is confound free, uh, which means only the IV is changing between conditions, nothing else. Uh, external validity, how well the results can be generalized to other frames, that is taking the results of your study and applying them to different times, different settings, and different people than the people, setting, and times that you've had in your experiment. Ecological validity, how natural the procedure is in the experiment, that is how true to life or how natural the experiment is to the subjects in it. And finally, although it's not really that important for this class since you had, haven't had uh, stats yet, mostly, uh, you know, statistical conclusion validity, whether the correct statistical tests were used. And we're going to be just touching on that. So let's uh, go to uh, the different types of validity and take them in turn. Uh, first, we have construct validity. Uh, and basically, it's how well you operationalize the hypothetical constructs in your experiment. If, for example, aggression was a hypothetical construct, a, a dependent variable, for example, uh, then you're going to have to have an operational definition of it. How are you going to measure aggression? And you come up with an operational definition of counting the number of aggressive acts on a playground over a 30-minute period. That's your operational definition. And to have good construct validity, uh, you need to have operational definitions that are well chosen and are working well. Uh, so how do you ensure this? Uh, you basically ensure that the independent variables are working as expected. Uh, in our example experiment from the beginning of the semester, the independent variable with the amount of violence in two uh, cartoon clips. And so what you would do is have a pilot study, a little uh, mini study before you do the real study. And you'd want to have a manipulation check. That is, you're going to manipulate the level of violence in the cartoon clip and so you want to check to see if the subjects actually recognize that there's a difference, and the difference is in the direction you want. So I would play the two uh, clips uh, to different students or maybe the same kids, and I would have them rate on some scale how violent or how much violence was occurring. And hopefully there would be a significant difference between the two, and what I consider to be the violent clip would be rated as more violent. And that's a manipulation check. Uh, when we go to the dependent variables uh, and whether or not they're working as expected, uh, basically we're talking about the uh, elements of a good test, uh, validity and reliability. And so uh, you should always have good uh, validity and good reliability data for uh, tests and DV measures that you're using. 
And if you're not going to use a test, if you're going to use a test without reliability and validity information, you're going to have a bad time. Internal validity means that the experiment is confound free. That is, uh, between the different levels of the independent variable, the only thing that changes is the independent variable. There are no extraneous variables that are confounded with the levels of the independent variable. There are three general categories of threats to internal validity. Uh, differential treatments of condition, differential treatment of conditions, biasing, and uh, controlling subject variables. Uh, you know, these threats to internal validity deal basically with treating different treatment conditions differently. Uh, so if you treat your control and your treatment conditions differently based on one of these uh, threats, then you're going to have less than perfect internal validity. Uh, for example, history. And everything on this list is in uh, McBride, so I'm just summarizing it. History is a non-IV event which affects the DV, and again, this is differential. So it's only happening to one condition and not the other. Maturation, participants you know, mature or grow up during the experiment. And again, uh, differentially, so therefore subjects in one condition are growing faster or maturing faster than the others. They may be hitting a growth spurt. Uh, regression to the mean, uh, you created groups based on a pretest. And now you've created uh, groups uh, using some type of differential bias. And one group will regress towards the mean differently than the other group. Uh, testing, you use the same pre and post tests. So subjects will recognize the pre and post tests, and that may change their behavior. And finally, uh, participant problems with differential uh, treatment, where subjects are assigned to conditions differently uh, based on the condition, uh, or attrition, that is, subjects leave one condition uh, more quickly or uh, for a specific reason than in another condition. Experimenter bias uh, are when the experimenter expectations can influence subject behaviors. And Rosenthal's stu uh, studies uh, demonstrated how this can affect experiments. Researchers can have biases. Biases are usually the hypotheses they want to support. And so they will consciously or unconsciously, based on these biases, treat subjects differently or see what they're doing differently uh, based on their biases. And we can control for these biases by automating the procedure of the experiment so the uh, you know, researcher's bias won't have an effect. Uh, we can standardize the procedure. Uh, so as long as you follow the uh, standard procedure, you probably are not having an effect uh, if you do have a bias. Or using a double-blind procedure uh, where the uh, researcher is unaware which condition the subject is in. So even if they do have a bias, uh, they don't know if this is the subject that should work well or, or shouldn't. So these are ways to control for experiment or bias. And then there's participant bias, uh, biases that the participants can have. Uh, one set of biases are you know, categorized as demand characteristics. A demand characteristic is a clue in the experiment or a clue given by the researcher that kind of gives away the purpose of the experiment. Uh, in an experiment, the participant should be responding to the situation uh, at its face value. We don't want the uh, participant to be thinking about, well, this is an experiment. What, should I, what does the researcher want me to do? How am I behaving? How does the researcher see me? If we are doing a cognition experiment, we want uh, the subject to basically focus on the material to be memorized. Uh, and not to think about the fact that they're in an experiment memorizing materials. Uh, so we want to keep these demand characteristics at a minimum and have the subjects focus on the material uh, or the situation that we want them to focus on and that we want to study. Uh, but the more that uh, we put these demand characteristics or cues in the experiment, the more that they're going to distract the subjects. And 
uh, this could lead to a couple problems. One problem is that most subjects want to be good subjects. And so if they figure out what uh, you know, the researcher wants them to do, even if they're wrong, but they just they think that, oh, this is what the experiment's about, uh, then what happens is they say, well, I want to help that you know, experimenter out. And so they will artificially change their behavior uh, to meet that uh, demand characteristic. That's not actual real life behavior, and we're not interested in it. Uh, there's also bad subjects, and if they think they figured out the hypothesis, they may be angry that they're in the experiment, and so they may just do the complete opposite of what they think the researcher wants them to do. But again, it does, they don't need to really know for a fact what the real purpose of the study is, as long as they think they understand it, even if they're wrong about that, that will cause them to behave artificially. Another element of the demand characteristics is the more that the subject thinks they're in an experiment being observed, oh, you know, they're going to be apprehensive, and that may be artificial and not true to life. Uh, then there's the Hawthorne effect, which is just knowing that you're in an experiment, you want to put your best foot forward, best face forward, and so you want to, you know, try to perform as well as you can. And in the Hawthorne studies, uh, they found that subjects kept on improving their performance uh, because they knew that researchers were watching them. And so uh, how do we control for these participant biases? Well, one way we can control is to deceive the subjects. That is, if a subject is unaware they're in an experiment at all, or unaware of what the purpose of the experiment is about, and they believe it's something else, then uh, we should not have any biases. Uh, we should use also manipulation checks. Or sometimes these are called hypothesis checks, where after the experiment we ask subjects, what did you think the experiment was about? And we hope that the subjects will say, I, I don't know, or something not on near what you were really studying. Uh, or you could do field research. Uh, in the field, uh, when a subject is somebody walking down the street, not even aware or possibly aware that they're in an experiment, then there can't be any biases of them as a participant. Of course, that's very difficult ethically to do experiments like that. And then a final kind of internal validity topic is the uh, control of subject variables. Uh, subject variables are the differences between uh, subjects in your experiment, males versus females, right-handers versus left-handers, high IQs versus low IQ, uh, race, these are all subject variables. We control these uh, subject variables uh, you know, two major ways. One is between subject designs, where we use matching or random assignment. And that's, those are appropriate controls of uh, subject differences. In within subject designs, uh, we need to control for order effects because a within subject design itself is a control of subject differences. But then we also have order effects, and so we have to use counterbalancing appropriately to uh, remove those order effects. And then also we have to worry about carryover effects. Uh, carryover effects will uh, ruin a within subject design, and so if you have carryover effects, you have to use between subjects.